Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. As outdoorsmen and women, the majority of us rely on public land access to recreate, fish, and hunt. But like my mom has always told me, nothing in life is ever really free. Every year, bills are being pushed to strip our access and opportunities to rivers and land to be sold to private investors or limit public access. One organization that has been the amplified voice to keep all boots in the water or on the trail is Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Joining me today is Director of Innovative Alliance for BHA, Rachel Schmidt. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Lauren. So fun to be here talking with you. I know. We, we needed this to happen. And um, as an advocate and, uh, and participant in the outdoors, I know that you do not have a shortage of fishing stories, and I can't wait to hear one. Yeah, that is the truth. Um, many, many fishing stories. Um, would you like me to just dive into talking about some fishing right now? Splash right in. Sweet. Um, well, when you, you know, we were talking about that and you're like, oh, let's talk about a fishing story. So spring for me, um, actually spring fishing like represents this like amazing period in my life where I was able to fish with my grandfather a lot, like a lot, a lot. And um, my grandfather was just this super remarkable outdoorsman. Um, you know, he was actually born here in Northwest Montana, as were my parents. And then I was born up here. I am now raising my kids up here. And my grandfather's like true, he was a hunter for sure, but his like true passion in life was definitely fly fishing. Um, we had like a shop in his backyard that was literally the family fly tying shop. That's what we did all winter. Um, and he became just really, really focused and passionate about fishing a lot of the lakes that are on the Eastern front of Montana as in like the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains, sorry, Um, kind of in the northern part of the state. It's a really brutal climate, but gorgeous and and the fishing can be amazing. And he became really focused on that when I was like, you know, like fifth and sixth grade. And when I was like, literally like a sixth and seventh grader is when I really, really got into fly fishing. Um, And it was something like you like couldn't help, but do I think in our family, if you had an open mind, it was like our family was like the walking rendition of a river runs through it um, (laughs) with like a grandpa and then two sons and like everybody fishes. But yeah, we, so my grandpa and I were just best of fishing buddies from the time I was in junior high and then into high school. And so there was this beautiful like five year stretch of my youth that I was just my grandpa's shadow and he and I in the springtime, you know, like it was cool because like, it's like I said, it's this like brutal climate and you would really want to go over and you would, you know, fish ice off on these lakes and, you know, kind of getting there, like you never really knew like what warm front rolling in would like loosen up the ice and So he and I would start in the springtime and that was back like obviously before it was like really like consistent calling to get like updates from like any fly shops or anything from the area over there or there was no like website you could visit that would like give you a report. I'm I I hate that I'm so old that I'm saying these things. Um, (laughs) But, you know, he and I would literally like he'd pick me up at like five in the morning and we would drive over early, early in the spring having no clue if there was any open water. And we would drive over and some days we would literally drive for three hours to get to the lake to look down to see it's completely frozen still and get in the car and turn around and drive all the way back. And it was just, you know, like that's how you did it. And he and I would even do that like two days in a row. We had the luxury of having only a three hour drive. Um, But we would even do it three days in a row because you just never knew. And, you know, finally we would like hit that sweet spot and you could see that the ice was breaking up around the shore because a lot of the fish do like a false spawn um, in those lakes over there. And they do come into the shallows. You can be, you can sight cast um, to the, you know, really fun fish. 
And, you know, we, you know, we'd be so stoked. We'd get there and be like, yeah, there's like 30 feet, 40 feet of like open water between shore and the actual like ice on the lake. And even when we'd get there in the morning, it would have like an inch or two of like fresh ice. So even the open water would have frozen over. Seriously, back in the day, like no one hardly ever wears neoprene anymore. (laughs) <laughs> and um, we'd be in neoprene waders, which is absolutely what you needed with like 35 pairs of socks and like every layer possible. And we'd go out there and we'd like break all the ice and we'd like make these big areas to like cast into you. And then we'd start fishing and your eyelets would freeze up every cast. Um, but that's how we started our spring every year. And obviously as the weekends went on, the wind would pick up, but the ice would go away. And um it was just super fun. And, you know, I remember like even like getting into high school, like you get into your teenage years and like for as much as I was very outdoorsy and loved to like go, you were still a teenager and like the getting up early, you were like, this is terrible. <laughs> and um, that's when I started drinking Folgers coffee, you know, with my grandpa. And then of course, white bread sandwiches with Miracle Whip and um, bologna, you know, like, like soup and then Lay's, the yellow bag of Lay's potato chips. And that's what we lived on is coffee, bologna, and potato chips, as one should. Which back then, everyone was like, that's a healthy lunch. I had some white bread, and now everyone's like, oh, white bread? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. And now it's like this nostalgic, you know, thing. And I can remember, like, in my teenage years, I'd, like, take – I'd literally take a sleeping bag and a thermorest. So, like, if my dad would come along or my uncle or we'd have, like, a group of us – because you get there and sometimes like the fishing isn't like on and you got to like go figure it out. Like, well, where are they at today? Where are they, where are they potting up? Where are they cruising? What flies working, you know? And so I would literally like we'd crawl out of the you know truck at like eight in the morning. And I, as a like freshman in high school, would like crawl into my sleeping bag and just lay on shore napping. And then like every half hour, I'd like look up to see if anyone was catching fish. And if anyone was catching fish, then I was like, okay I'll totally go you know I guess you figured out where it is exactly I'm like okay now I'll get my stuff on and I'll go fish but I think you know just talking to you like during the spring like this is when that kind of fishing is happening and so that's really what it makes me think of and it's funny that you know I can definitely think of some specific fish you know and some specific days but it's just the calm you know like the accumulation of all of those years and like how so thankful I am to have had that time with my grandfather. It wasn't really about going fishing, you know, like when you look back on it, it's like, yeah, you were going fishing, you were going fishing. But in the grand scheme of things, it was like this amazing excuse to just be together and spend time together. And so many people were, have, I mean, not fortunate enough to spend time like that with their grandparents. So that's, that's really kind of what crossed my mind, you know, I was first thinking about fishing this time of year. And isn't it true, like, as you get older, like, your perspective of what you did when you're younger is totally different? Like you said, probably back when you were younger in high school, you're like, yes, I'm going fishing with my grandfather. But then as you get older, you're like, that was so much more than just going fishing with my grandfather. Because he was probably thinking, here I am, I'm going to be teaching her traditions and uh, memories. And I also feel with traditions, that's what back hunters and anglers is really about is like, how do we get these future generations to maintain our traditions and these uh, values with family and friends in the outdoors? So if you could maybe give me a little bit of detail about, about back, back country hunters and anglers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're absolutely correct. I, I, of course, like my progression, I've had a very, very blessed life and career. I have, held and worked in some amazing um, jobs. I've had an amazing career path and I've been very fortunate to be able to, you know, pick and choose and work for people, things, places that I truly believe in. And I feel that my energy is well spent and um, my, the progression of my career has been beautiful and organic. And I, in the last six months have started working with backcountry hunters and anglers. And this would be my first official job with them, but I have been working with the organization for about eight years. And I started working with the organization as a corporate partner when I worked for Kimber Manufacturing as a firearms manufacturer, became very familiar with the organization, understanding, you know, this is the sportsman's voice for public land, water, and wildlife. Um, Background Hunters and Anglers works to ensure the heritage of hunting and angling in wild places. 
um, and you know, working towards opp opportunity and access for everyone. So obviously, knowing my background and you know what I've worked on in my life, like that is the, at the core what I care about and what I believe in. So the opportunity to work with all of these amazing people, I did serve on the National Board of Directors for some time. I worked with the organization when I ran the Montana Governor's Office of Outdoor Recreation. So coming here and working for those values that I just stated, it's it couldn't be a better fit. Um, the organization is really, truly remarkable because this organization is about its members. The organization exists to support its members' voices, to support its members' actions on behalf of the land, wildlife, habitat, water, opportunity, access. Um, it's about giving tools and amplifying all of that. And I have never met a, a more interesting, humble, remarkable group of people in my life every year when we gather or I'm at events or I meet people who are members. Um, it's, it's amazing. If I always tell everybody, I'm like, well, if you think you're a badass and you do really <laughs> cool things, you just come hang out with the people I hang out with. And you're gonna be like, I gotta try harder. Um, but the funny thing is though, it's not a contest. That's not what this is about. This is about people from, you know, the demographics of our membership is across the continent. We have chapters in all but two states. We have chapters in provinces, territories. Um, and so, and you know, like we're, it's a young group of people. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation is, you know, public land, um, water, wildlife. Like this is where we all have this shared interest. Like these are all these are these are things that we all care about no matter where we come from. So it's this really easy, natural, amazing space for people to get to know each other, and you get to know people you never thought you would meet, you never thought you'd run across. People that you know have experience in places you're like, whoa, this is amazing. So as much as you come together and you know that you are like people and that you believe in the same things and you care about the same things, you know that you're all so different. And that is what is so beautiful about this organization and its members. And I think that BHA has a lot of things coming up where um, constantly bills are being passed, bills are being changed, renamed to maybe um, take away those, our heritage and our traditions and our ability to make these memories. And I think that BH, BHA does such a great job being like, informing. I mean, and it's really just really informing people to be a voice like, Hey, listen, this is what you need to do. It's actually pretty easy. It's like, swipe up. This is what you need to do. Here's something that you can say, like we have it already writ written for you, but if you want to make it a personal note, like, please do that. And I think that's just such an easy way where people, it's like, it doesn't take much to be a voice. BHA does a really good job in informing everybody like, Hey, this is what's going on. They've changed it. They changed the name of the bill. Get on top of it. Um, and circling back, you were also the first female director of um, the outdoor recreation. And I think that's incredible. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that position and um, what you had to do in that yeah, absolutely. And you're so right. And that's so, so many conservation organizations out there are doing remarkable, awesome things. And all of these organizations really work and complement each other in the work that we do. And so much conservation is what we always think of as like this boots on the ground, like this tangible place in the dirt, the, this space in this place. And we think about how can we physically act upon these things? But like you just mentioned, so much of what impacts our land and our opportunity and our access and our wildlife and the health of all of this is the government process, the political process yeah. because of governing agencies, because of land ownership, a myriad of reasons. And so that's why using our voices and acting in that way to interact with policymakers, with decision makers, and talking about that, because really we're the people that are experts in our space. You may not think like that, but we are because we're on the ground. We see it, we use it, we know it, we love it. This is what oftentimes makes you know our, our business thrive. And so, you know, actually encouraging people, it is our job as US citizens or provincial, you know, um, residents, like it's our job to interact with the people that we elect. We're the ones that inform them on our values, on what is important to us. And so this is not something where you should feel 
Um, you know, like you should feel, you shouldn't feel nervous. You shouldn't feel any of these things. You should just know that this is your, this is our job. It is our job to reach out. And these elected officials are counting on us to speak up. This is where we can impact things. And so that's where, you know, oftentimes BHA is different because it is about educating our members to go take action because it's the individual voice that makes the difference. And like you said, I saw that firsthand. Um, I was the, um, Montana was the fourth state in the U.S. to create a governor's office of outdoor recreation. And I was the first female um, director totally happy to say that women have absolutely started populating states very quickly after me. So that's great, great mix of guys and gals out there. And yeah, the Office of Outdoor Recreation was really this kind of um, pivotal moment that really signaled the fact that we identify outdoor recreation this thing that we love, that we're passionate about, that we feel good about, that we like doing, it actually is a segment of the U.S. economy as anything else is. Absolutely. And where that's impactful is like when we are talking with lawmakers or we are making decisions, um, you know, as it relates to the use of our natural resources. For many, many years, it was just talking about how it makes us feel. It's it's just the good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But we need we needed to broaden the way we speak about those things and we needed to speak in economic terms. And so really it's identifying that outdoor recreation is this actual huge powerhouse segment of the US economy, contributing a tremendous amount of money to our GDP. Um, these are jobs, the, this is tax revenue. This is, um, you know, all of those, those, those key buzzwords that I just use in economics terms, <laughs> like that is what lawmakers, that is what politicians, that is what business people are used to hearing. And so in order for us to oftentimes communicate our message, we need to learn how to speak another language. And it doesn't take a, it doesn't take away the fact that we all need clean air. We, know, we all need healthy land. Those are all the things we need to be healthy and thrive, and it's the right thing to do, but it also has this economic impact too. And so often that's the first language that people will look at. So it enables us to just broaden our nomenclature so we are you know, able to communicate what we want and what we desire in different ways. So yeah, the offices of our direct doing amazing, remarkable things, um, working on behalf of the economy, working on behalf of just citizens and our recreation opportunities. And it's all our responsibility to be communicating and working together to make sure that we're um, keeping it all healthy and it's all working together. Absolutely. And like I said, you know, when you think public, you think it's free, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. And you just kind of forget that it is a political thing. Your public lands are a part of the politics. And um, just to be informed in that is just so vital. Um, Can you give me a little bit of information? Because your title is the Director of Innovative Alliances. So what does a Director of Innovative Alliances do? Yeah, you know, BHA, we don't do things inside the box. And I've known that for years. So um, when it came time to taking over my new role, I was like, no, let's think about this a little bit differently and let's apply our values to what it is we're trying to accomplish. So I'm overseeing business development and fundraising for organization. um, And that's what we're doing. We're just seeking out uh, and working with partners and people who think like-mindedly as we do about public land, wildlife, water, and how can we work together to help protect these spaces, to conserve these spaces, um, and keep them healthy for the future. So, you know, a partnership in business development or fundraising can look, um, it can look a lot of different ways. And that's what we're really all about is working together in new and innovative ways to make sure that we're taking care of all of our shared responsibilities together. That sounds like a really big job. Like you did that in such a great sentence and like description, but I'm sure it comes with a lot of uh, negotiating and um, working with other people to come together. And even though we all love the outdoors, I'm sure there's a lot of different opinions on how that all needs to come together. Well, for sure. We were even, it was funny, we were talking the other day and, you know, there's, you know, when you're talking about our public lands just specifically, and this is a we in the United States have done things differently. And I encourage anyone, you know, that wants to educate themselves about the history of our public lands and the present, you know, state of our public lands, please do so. There's so many amazing books, um, resources out there, documentaries, 
Um, but it is this like huge, vast public treasure. And we certainly use those things. And, you know, it's about natural resources. It's about space. And, you know, recreation is the sustainable and renewable, you know, use of our resources, right? It's very similar to maybe like the timber industry. Um, and so, you know, recreation, this is something that it's not infinite. Um, it is a finite resource. And so when Ever you have all of these different competing interests wanting to use all of our resources, mm-hmm. for sure you're you're gonna run in, you're gonna butt heads on stuff. Um, but you know that's why you can proactively work together in collaboration. That's why you know you can often work in compromise. But um, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there to make progress. We've seen that, and you know through the years of articulating recreation and public land habitat, um, all of these open spaces in a different way. You know, in 2020, we were able to pass significant legislation on the national level. We had um, the, you know, it was the Great American Outdoors Act. And the two parts of that were, you know, full permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And then also identifying there was this maintenance backlog that needed to be addressed on public lands and spaces. And that is, that was kind of a watershed moment because, you know, as I've spoken about outdoor recreation, it's a segment of this economy we have to look at like, what are the unique resources or what are the unique things that support that? And so I would call that our infrastructure. So what is the infrastructure that's unique to our segment of the industry? And that is just like I said, it's land, water, open space, habitat, wildlife. That's the quote unquote unique infrastructure that supports our industry. So when people are starting to identify, well, infrastructure needs maintenance, infrastructure needs upkeep. We need to maintain infrastructure to keep a viable, healthy segment of our economy. It just so happens that this segment of our economy has vast, you know, impacts on our health and well-being, whether mentally or physically and other. So it's it's really, really cool to see that shift in conversation. And we're starting to see things differently and in a more open light. There's people that have been working on this for 20 and 30 years. This is nothing new, but, you know, all of a sudden, you know, things, the stars align right. And then all of a sudden your message becomes more clear and people are hearing you in a different way. And that's when we get to move the needle. I love that. I mean, seriously, I guess BHA will always be around because I think as time continues and people are trying to move more West and try and recreate the more that we need to preserve all of this public land. So, um, you know, I think that your job as the Innovative Alliance is very well said because you have to be innovative and in trying to continue to think outside the box and how do we keep adjusting because it's not always that simple of like, this is what we do and then it'll be done. Like, no, you got to you gotta think outside the box. Yeah. Well, and it's I, I joke all the time because even like being on the national board and like working in the space and being so passionate that and I feel so fortunate now that I can spend my personal and my work life focused on this and my energy spent toward this, but I was laughing. I'm like, no, no, no. My goal is to put (laughs) myself out of a job. Like in a perfect (laughs) world, I wouldn't need to exist, right? Because in a perfect world, every person would see the value in our public lands and spaces as I do, and we would all jointly take care of them. And there would never be a question. So my goal, yes, is ultimately to work myself out of a job. I would like to be jobless. Um, but I unfortunately do not think that is going to happen in my lifetime. Well said. I mean, it'd be great to be out of the job, which means that the world is, everyone's on the same page. Everybody wants public access, but it's, uh, that's not that easy. For anybody though, that wants to know more about BHA, we've got like this really kick butt, um, event coming up, um, and would totally, you know, love to give tickets away to some of your listeners if you're interested, um, we do that. the North American Rendezvous every year. Last year, it went virtual very quickly because of 2020. Uh, this year, it's the 10th anniversary of our North American Rendezvous. And we understand that we're still rolling out of COVID. We are not done with this and that there's various levels of comfort and vaccination. So we are holding it live in person in Fort, at Fort Missoula in Missoula, Montana, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th. But we're also holding it virtually. Um, And so we're going to be live streaming about 75% of what is going on at at Rendezvous. 
kind of like man on the street style. You'll be able to actually see all of our corporate partners and what they've got going on in cooking. You've got um, our different villages. We've got a wild game village. We've got hunting, a fishing village. There's demonstrations from brain tanning. We'll be butchering an entire bison over the course of two days. What? Um, and, yeah, and Trigger and Camp <laughs> Chef are there and there's gonna be guest chefs from across the US like showing butchering techniques and cooking techniques. Um, we have storytelling, which is always a, kind of like the premier thing where people get up on stage and tell just amazing, interesting, funny, sad, awe-inspiring stories. Um, there's a wild game cook-off. Our chapters compete against one another to cook. Um, lots of games. Um, we have panel discussions that hit on, you know, kind of some hard-hitting current event topics um, and help educate people. So it's one of those things if you're, you've heard about it and it looks like fun, awesome, road trip it, fly over, there's camping, it's 100% outdoors, which is what's really cool about this. But if you want to just kind of pop in and see, you can buy a virtual ticket, you can watch things live, or you can watch them recorded after the fact. And it'll give you a flavor for what BHA is all about, what our members are all about, what we find interesting. Um, so it's a great opportunity to include so many more people on that virtual level. So we're really excited about that. Well, and I love the location. Port Missoula is amazing. The fact that it's a historical site, like you get to basically kind of feel like you're walking back in time. And yes. so what a great platform to have um, a place where people can tell their stories, their fishing, and also just to present, you know, bills that are coming up and things that need to take action. And so what a great place to do it is in a historical site like Fort Missoula. And the thing that's good about Fort Missoula is that it is really open space. I mean, you can really maintain social distancing out there. So um, exactly. I think it's a great location. Will the wood ch chopping go on too? Oh. I think it's so cool. My kids love it. They're just like, but it's so loud. Yeah, no, what, but it is funny. So that's where the U of M, University of Montana Forestry School has like their logging operation is out there. But yes. it's, what's really cool is that we'll be able to have campfires out in one of our areas. And so that's where we're getting all of the wood for our campfires. <laughs> it's from the forestry students. <laughs> I love it. They got to get that extra credit. They're like, okay, here, who here needs to make some extra credit and want to chop some wood? Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, okay. And the rendezvous remind is they can either go to backcountryhunters.org and go um, on your website or um, follow on Instagram or we might be, and we'll be doing the giveaway too yeah. on this podcast. And I was yeah. thinking the way that I'm going to do this giveaway, Rachel, is I'm going to be talking about what is your favorite fly and whoever can tell me what Rachel Schmidt's favorite fly will get the tickets. So you got to give me, um, tell me what is your favorite fly to use for fishing? And we, let's do, well, you know what? I'm going to make it. I saw that you caught an amazing permit. And yes. um, I want to know what fly did you use to catch that permit? Okay. Well, it's, it's not my favorite fly, but it will be added to my tattoo collection. So this is, I guess, flies like, again, I'm a big time fisherman. I collect fly tattoos on my back. So <laughs> I, I did have not know this. 12 flies now tattooed. I have three more in line because that was, you know, going to Mexico. I am real um, shy on saltwater flies. So I agreed like, okay, the first, like the first species, every species I catch, whatever fly I catch that first one on, that's what I'll get the tattoo of. So I did catch a beautiful, amazing permit. Um, I do feel like, you know, I hadn't been saltwater fishing in a long time and I just was so happy to be there. I feel like the saltwater gods were looking down and they were like, oh, bless Rachel. <laughs> she has not been here for so long. We will send her a mildly idiot tarpon or a permit, you know, her direction and just <laughs> like set off for a trip. And so they find the stupidest <laughs> permit they could, which happened to be a beast. I thought, yes, it and, is a beast. Uh, 16 yeah. pounds. So it was literally like the first fish of the trip was that permit on day one. Um, I caught him on an amazing crab pattern that a good buddy of mine, Karsten Carlson, he's an amazing saltwater fly tire. He um, tied up a bunch of um, Solar patterns and crab patterns sent me with all of his flies. So that is going to be my crab pattern tattoo. Um, but my it. favorite fly and, you know, most people who know me, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rachel has this fly, this this one fly. Um, the first dry fly that my grandfather ever taught me how to tie was a royal wolf. Just the plain old attractor pattern, the royal wolf. 
And that was my very first tattoo was a royal wolf. And so as a result, that just has continued to be like my favorite fly of all times. So I need to get a kind of visual on this. It's on your back. Are they like going down vertically, horizontally? Well, when I got my first tattoo, it was in college. And at the time, the tattoo that was right up at your lower back above your butt crack was <laughs> not called a tramp stamp. And so I just decided that was where I was going to start. Of course, then you learn later on down the road, you now have given yourself a tramp stamp. <laughs> um, and so now they all wrap up from that point. They wrap all the way up the left side or the, sorry, the right side of my rib cage up into my lower back and up to my shoulder. Oh, are, are they big? Like how size, what size are we looking at? Yeah, most of them are trout patterns, whether it be like a green machine or a damsel or an ant pattern. So a lot of them are really small, um, but I do have, I caught a, just a, a, an amazing beast of a redfish a few years ago down out of Louisiana. And so I got that fly tattooed. And so by far that guy is the biggest for sure. Okay, so the flies are actually like life size. Correct. Yeah, they are to scale. Oh my gosh. So the Royal Wolf, you're like, oh, this wasn't, this wasn't horrible. Well, and all my guides and my, well, and this is the funny part. Like when I announced to my guides in Mexico, I was like, all right guys, like, this is what I do. I like showed them my tattoos and I'm like, so whatever. And they were like, any fly? And I'm like, yeah, any fly, which that <laughs> actually leads to another great story. But um, any fly. And they were like, sweet. So they were like hell bent on me catching a barracuda on a giant needlefish <laughs> pattern because it's huge. They're like, this is amazing. And then pretty soon they were like drawing things on me with markers and picking out where they wanted them to go. And it was fairly funny. You can actually um, follow that whole um, process on my Instagram page because it was pretty funny. So I want to hear the story. Well, so I was, you know, it was like, if we're going to like tell one more story. Uh, yeah, so let's do it. Speaking of, so I've, I've got these fly tattoos and, and this is what I, I just love to do. And so I was actually headed with some mutual friend of ours um, to New Zealand for a month. And we were shooting a um, TV show um, for a month in New Zealand. Like, how cool is that? And essentially we were just filming. I mean, like it was literally all we were doing was like hunting and fishing our way across New Zealand um, in a couple camper vans. And it was super fun. And I was like, it, the focus is hunting, right? Like the focus was hunting, but it was like, we can like do all of these other peripheral things. And like the few, first few days we were there, we had like this small window of opportunity before their trout season shut down to go fishing. And in my mind, I'm losing my shit because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to fish New Zealand. So I'm like pumped. Like it's all I can think about. Everybody's like, we're hunting. And I'm like, I know, but we're fishing too. <laughs> um, and so we get to New Zealand and we spend like the first three days and we actually, you know, we actually hired some guides and we did, uh, everybody kind of thinks of New Zealand as like these like crystal clear water with like the boulders and the like kind of almost like rainforesty look is like this traditional like New Zealand river fishing. We actually went out and we actually fished some lakes that were very similar to like what our, you know, like prairie pothole lakes would be the huge fish out there. And, you know, I was fishing like little chronomen patterns the first night. I just could not, like I, I had a couple on, but I like couldn't hook them. I couldn't bring them in. And of course I go into this trip saying everybody and I announce very loudly. Okay, everybody, I am going to get a tattoo of the first, you know, first fish I catch in New Zealand. I'm getting a tattoo of that fly. So we get nothing on that day. And then we're going out to this river. That's more of like this meandering, like it's almost like you take a spring creek that was rolling through one of those beautiful long grass meadows, but you like then blow it up like times 50. It's just like meandering river. So we were going to catch, you know, we're going to fish these huge brown trout. And I mean, it was nuts. And we fished and fished and fished and fished. Literally the guys were like, you can, like you're doing everything right. Like it's just like the hardest like fish. We're just not catching anything. But the problem was, is they were like, okay, you're going to get out this fly right here. And I'm like, what the hell's that? It's basically a shit fly. Like if you have a pile of shit in the middle of a meadow and you see the black flies like buzzing around it. Yes. That is literally the fly that they were like, that is the ticket. And of course no. I look up and our friends, Mike and Dory, they just look at me and we all burst out laughing because they're like, oh my God, Rachel's going to get a shit fly tattooed on her because <laughs> she has already promised that she is going to get the first fly tattooed. <laughs> Needless to say, thank God the fish were not cooperating. We fished for two days. No one can catch. We just didn't catch anything. And so I then 
continued to stalk Trout, much to our cameraman's dismay, in very odd, weird, wild ways. Like, they have footage of me belly crawling, rolling, like you name it, trying to get on these little tiny creeks with these huge brown trout, like when I could in between hunts, and just nothing ever came together. Finally, literally, we're out on a lake trolling deep and we catch a fish. And I was like, well, it's not a fly. We've had it on a spinning rod, so this does not count. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was my close call with a shit fly tattoo. Oh my gosh. I swear. I feel like I would pick first fish I caught and I had to put a tattoo on. I think I'd always be catching fish with like flashaboo, like something that's like super pretty that has nothing to do with catching fish. Right. Yes. So what's, so you got the permit one is up next. When is that going to be done? Yeah. Well, actually, so since my, my buddy that ties these flies is also an artist, he is going to actually draw them up for me and then I'll get them done, but we don't have the drawings yet. And I'm sure when I get those new tattoos, I will be posting them on my Instagram page. And what is your Instagram page to keep up with all of your adventures? It's Rachel Schmidt, but it's at M T R A E R A E Montana Ray Ray. Oh, I love it. And if if they aren't really into social media, can they reach out to how can they reach out to you via email? Yeah, absolutely. So you can I'm easy to find on Backcountry Hunters and Anglers webpage. Um, you can go to um, the donations page and go under donations. Um, I'm listed there because I take up fundraising. So you can find me under the staff directory there. Uh, it's just Rachel Schmidt at backcountryhunters.org. It's sh- sorry, Schmidt, Schmidt at backcountryhunters.org. Um, but yeah, feel free to shoot an email over um, and i um, happy to visit, happy to fill anyone in on anything that is BHA or other. Um, and yeah, just like to get out there. Yeah. And it's always changing. So, I mean, it's, there's never a dumb question is what I've always been told. So any questions are always accepted, right? Yes. All questions are accepted. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining me today, Rachel. And I want to go fishing with you and then maybe you can get a tattoo. I'll choose you a really nice fly. I'm not going to choose you any shit flies. Awesome. Yeah, I would totally appreciate that. (laughs) Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the February room.com. The February room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February room, and we'll see you down here next week. <laughs>